coming. Hello, hello, we are live. How is everybody tonight? Feeling grateful. Feeling Absolutely. Grateful. It's hump day. Happy hump day. Hump day. <laughs> Happy hump day. So I'm here with all my friends. I love this show because I get to be with my friend. Dr. <laughs> Mo, I love you. Dr. Mo is here with me for The Doctor Is In. And we have Mima Carmo, my breastie, and my breastie Jamil Rivers, and my breastie Bobby Albany. And I'm so excited to have you guys here tonight. So Dr. Mo, you want to kick us off a little bit or... Uh, sure. You know what? I want to welcome everybody tonight. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. We are talking about inclusion and we are going to go specifically into the details surrounding the inclusion pledge. So right now, health equity is a hot topic. It is a buzzword. Everybody wants to learn more about implicit bias. And, you know, as it relates to breast cancer, we know that the health, the health disparity has existed and persisted despite awareness, despite campaigns, despite walks, despite funding, uh, despite the advent of new clinical trials. And we feel that it is time to take our commitment to the next level and invite all of those of you who are allies, whether you're new allies, whether you're existing, whether you are corporate or nonprofit, uh, we want to talk about inclusion of black women specifically as it relates to breast cancer in clinical trials because the statistics are astounding. We know that black women have a 40% higher mortality rate compared to our white counterparts. We know that we are diagnosed younger with more advanced disease. Yeah. Um, Ricky, you know, we can go over the stats. It's almost like a, like a mantra that people can yeah. just recite and run off. Like if I ask you right now, give me some stats on young women and, and breast cancer. Oh my goodness. Know? So, so um, black women under 35 get breast cancer at twice the rate and die at three times the rate of white women. Crazy. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You can't get a mammogram until you're 40. Well, we're dead. Okay. I learned oh. another statistic this week that blew me away, that Black women are 60% more likely to be diagnosed the first time with metastatic breast cancer than white women. Crazy. Why yep. is that? And it's really it's because right. Black mm -hmm. breast cancer is different. And we say that, that we are, that I, I like to say now that breast cancer is killing Black women at 40% higher rate. That's crazy. And in some states, it's as high as 60%. So yeah. this disease is something that we have to wrestle with. We have to get some equity around. And, and so I'm so glad we have um, you know, our brilliant brainiac, Rusty here, Mema, who has put a lot of energy and passion and love and brilliance into her inclusion pledge. So that's going to be our topic for tonight. And we, can, and we have much to share and much to talk about. But Mema, do you want to tell us what you've been working on? Because you, I know you're not sleeping. No, this is all like, you know, cream, <laughs> just looks like this. No, I just want to say thank you for the platform, um, Monique, Dr. Gary, and Ricky, and thanks to Jamil and Roberta and all those who supported the pledge. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer at 31 years old. Um, I didn't think about breast cancer before I got diagnosed. I didn't know that it mattered to me. And for us, this webinar is for people who think that, who don't understand how it, why it matters. And, um, and for me, the thing is reaching people who are facing inequities and that things should matter to before they happen to them. So what we're seeing in the Black community now is a very big disparity. And one of my dear friends, Shantae Drakeford described this, she says, the word means a great difference. And the difference is that Black women are dying, as Ricky said, said <laughs> at a 40% higher death rate. So whether the death is, is you know, by, um, you know, um, something we don't understand what is happening or whether it's happening by, you know, somebody killing, like it's, people are being killed by this disease and um, things have to change systemically. I think we all keep looking at having the same discussions over and over and over. I've been in this space for 14 freaking years, same conversation, same meetings, same people. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's important to listen often to new populations um, the way this began really was by two of my white friends having a conversation at a conference and a black woman saying, why isn't a black woman on the, on the, at the table, <coughs> sorry, at the table 
around conversations around disparities. Why are you talking about a population of women that isn't represented at this table? And they asked her to come up and that was, it was Christine and Julia and then Jersey got up on the stage and talked about, you know, the importance of black women having a place at the table. Um, we had subsequent conversations and got to a point where we said we had to make a commitment that if we're not at the table, we're not gonna be part of any kind of panels, you know, programs, anything that doesn't include a woman of color, meaning a black woman because black women you know, have a higher death rate and, and more aggressive breast cancers. And then we really thought more about specific, being more specific. And so when you look at, at inclusion, you know, what's happening in the world now is really showing us that people are not educated about what black people face, what we don't talk about, implicit biases, complicit biases, privilege, privilege using privilege for power and so forth. And so the pledge really calls upon people in every industry to see what they can do to ensure that we include Black people at all tables through all programming activities, throughout the policy, advocacy, scientific, you know, research communities to ensure we have equity across the table and create solutions that take breast, Black breast cancer from death to chronic, not terminal disease. And so the pledge has been really powerful in terms of we're helping women understand, Black women, that we have to write, we have to use our power in a way that's not just saying, asking, what are they doing for us? But how do we make sure that they work for us and people who don't understand what to do or who aren't taught what to do, use their privilege for power and help us move the needle down towards, um, you know, a world where there's no breast cancer and women of color don't die these high death, at these high death rates. Um, so that's kind of what the pledge is about. And it's taking that power we have to move privilege to action to equitable action that has this tied to metrics and numbers. And that's well, awesome, awesome, Mima. I think that- um, um, Did I explain that properly? Well, that was, that was fantastic. That was, that was yeah. fantastic. You know, we have this breast cancer ecosystem that we all live in as advocates and we all talk to each other every day and we're preaching to our choir because we all see what's going on here. So now this is bringing the world into our conversation and putting these things, these thoughts on the table you know, in a, in a great time. I mean, the, the, the good thing about COVID, the, the one good thing about it is that all the health disparities that we've lived with for our whole lives are now being put on the table. So mm -hmm. I just, just elevated the conversation now so we can impact everybody, not even people, just well, people who are <clears throat> you know, and, and, with, and with all the racial issues going on and coming to a head, I think that the thing is that it's hard is that there's so much pain in the world <laughs> that's coming to the surface. But how do we utilize that pain for purpose? How do we utilize that to heal people and to change systems? So people are angry, they're hurt. They've been holding in this for years. Black populations have had you know, um, generational pain that they've carried silently and sometimes unknowingly that contribute to disease and, and causation of other comorbidities. And so we wanna utilize this pledge as a platform to say, hello, black woman, hello, white woman, hello, everybody who wants to make a difference for in black lives that matter because they do matter and black people's lives matter very much so because they're facing a lot of inequities what can you pledge to do in your community community how can you put a black woman at the table at, on your board um you know as part of your clinical trial or how can you sign the pledge and ensure that as a white person you know when you're thinking about inclusion you think about it not as just you know saying i have black friends but how can you help us move the needle to ensure equity happens and the pledge gives you like step-by-step -step tactical things to do to ensure that that happens. Um, speaking of which, Jamil Rivers is, on, is, on is with us today. And Jamil's, I think the only black woman on a, a board of many boards where she's representing black women and, and helping to ensure that we have equitable change. Can you discuss what you do at different ways, Jamil? And tell us a little bit about your story as well because yes, the stories have Very power. Great. And I think it's a it's a great time to to yeah. highlight that through all of the statistics. And you know, yeah. we have been bombarded with statistics, but you know, our, our individual stories uh, bring things closer to home. And you know, right before you go, I do want to piggyback off of what Mama and, and Ricky said is that you know, we have at this time so many uh, allies who are looking for ways to get involved. They are frustrated, they feel helpless, whether at the individual level or at the corporate level. And what's so nice about this place is that it begins to take some of those feelings of helplessness and transform those into actionable items and steps that people can take. And, and so um, tell us your story and then give us some background and maybe even some of the dynamics and frustrations that you've had on some of the boards you've been on. 
Well, I was um, diagnosed with um, stage four breast cancer, and I was one of those black women that was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer from the beginning of my diagnosis two years ago, um, walking around under the age of 40, no real genetic testing. You know, I, uh, you know, had breast cancer in my family, but it was on my father's side. So it wasn't something that my OBGYN or, you know, just with my normal uh, reproductive health and breast health, that wasn't something that they actually said, you know, this makes sense for you. Now, now knowing, having the knowledge I have now, I should have started, gotten screened, you know, 10 years prior to my grandmother on my father's side being diagnosed. Again, it's just um, when you think about um, our white counterparts and white women, how from the beginning they're being taught about BRCA and uh, monitoring genetic testing and things like that. We typically as black women, when we encounter genetic testing for the first time, it's when we're pregnant. And so none of that conversation prior to, but um, two years ago, no signs or symptoms, typical mom, you know, working full time, crazy busy. Um, you know, my family all got their colds. My turn came, my cold didn't go away. So I'm constantly coughing and sneezing and all that. And then they're thinking I have asthma and everything else that didn't, that wasn't the case. Um, and then I had a little pinch on my side and gallbladder issues and appendicitis runs in my family. I asked for an ultrasound and come to find out I have tumors in my liver. And then fast forward, uh, breast biopsy, mammogram, ultrasound, liver biopsy. I have stage four breast cancer that has spread all over my body. And, you know, 60% of my liver is taken over by tumors. I have to do chemotherapy right away. My husband is already a cancer survivor and my kids are young. So me, of course, I'm thinking um, I can't, I, I never really questioned God's path for me, but I'm thinking to myself, why would God bless me with this wonderful family, the love of my life and these beautiful children. And I'm going to leave them when they already have a father that's a cancer survivor. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to do everything I can to learn about this and, and be knowledgeable about it. It's a new challenge. So <laughs> it's, um, you know, and I just started a new job, wasn't sure if I was eligible for FMLA, but everyone's on my benefits. So I got to work. Everyone said, you can't work um with chemotherapy and I said well let's see what happens I got my eyebrows tattooed I didn't tell my job I ended up getting a wig that looked like my hair and I just took it day by day and not knowing about breast cancer I decided you know what I I live in Philadelphia where we are such a mecca of research and innovation and all this and was surprised to learn that 50 percent of black women are well black women are dying at a 50 percent higher rate in Philadelphia. So we're one of the most egregious locations for um, disparities. So I was shocked by that. I wanna improve my odds for survival. So I'm like, I have to learn everything that I can. I need to know about what treatments are out there. What is the standard of care? What testing do I need access to? What drugs do I have access to? And that really, I can identify what, what the movement that's going on, going on now, because when you think about the history of black people in this country, and thinking about, okay, the inequities and injustices and us, we're following the rules. We're, you know, we're establishing our wealth. We're working hard. You know, we're putting our trust into the systems and institutions in place and trusting that they're gonna look out for us, not knowing that these knees are on our necks as we're going forward. And so I'm, I know I have to live for my baby. So I don't need anybody giving the cancer extra help to kill me and take me out. I need to know that I have the same level of access and care um, that the white woman down the hall is getting. And so that was really what I did in order to be proactive to advocate and you know understand and not just trust what's being presented to me. And Jamil. from that, I learned about you know how black women were not getting access to the same information or being offered those clinical trials or learning about genomic testing and genetic testing because not just of the social determinant, determinants of health that are impacting inequities already, but because of some of the implicit biases that some of these medical professionals are carrying that blocks us from getting the care that we should have access to. So Jamil, let me ask you a question. So you, you've done so much in, in just two years worth of time. And so for women who are watching who may be not affected by breast cancer or not touched by breast cancer or younger women who don't think this could affect them. 
you know, you found you found all of us, and you became a you become a force in the breast cancer advocacy space. Um, why is it? A, how did you find the group, and how can you share the path to advocacy for those who are watching who think, well, you know what, you know, this is never going to touch me, but it does, right? Um, yeah. And can you share the impact? Well, how you found the path, and 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 the the impact you've made in just two years because it's been a lot of work that you've done <laughs> <laughs> and, how, and how you support inclusion in all your work right and so what your me, advocacy has done for you too you know yes. how that change how that has transformed you and, and maybe empowered you mm -hmm. um i think breast cancer has taught me in this experience in the past two years is you know when i started getting involved it was more so thinking okay, let me um, increase my knowledge to improve my odds of survival. But come to find out as I'm working with these organizations and I'm trying to understand, well, what are you doing about the disparities of black women? But there were no black women in the room. There were no black women at the table. There was no black women um, determining how these resources were being allocated and where the money is going. They're just running the same script over and over again, like a rerun saying, you know, black women need help with transportation and child care and maybe, mm -hmm. you know, some access to care. But when you actually look at the data and statistics, what actually is going to make a difference? And so from me, it was more so tapping into the people of power in the breast cancer community, because let's be real, it's a very multi-million dollar industry. So if you have all this money, why are there disparities? That's what I really wanted to get to the root to. And if people are making decisions on, um, about how resources are allocated and thinking that it's just gonna be this trickle down effect where what we do for white women is gonna work for everybody else, obviously that's not working. So how about we get some black people in leadership at the table making decisions where if you're deciding that you're gonna address disparities, if you're serious about it, then you should have black bodies at the table. And that really was where it started from. Let me, let me jump in here and ask you, and then we're gonna to get to Bobby's story, but let me jump in and ask you, um, because you have seen, I think, and we have all watched the evolution of some of the uh, national breast cancer organizations as they have pivoted toward uh, health equities and movements toward health equity. And so now we have more black women at the table. Um, I, I think uh, it's safe to say, but um, what have you seen or not seen uh, that still needs to happen? You know, where are we in, in that pivot and, and why is this challenge so, so real and so pressing now? I think now the standard narratives about, oh, we don't know where the black people are, or we don't know, we got to study this. We got to figure it out. No, we have studied it to death. We know what to do. Put your money where your mouth is. And if you're serious about address the disparities, then step up and show it your, show and prove what you're going to do. You know, I'm tired of hearing the same script about, well, we got to figure it out. We, this will help, you know, women five years from now or 10 years from now. I have metastatic breast cancer now and I'm trying to survive for my kids. So when you're talking about all this research and the resources and what you're doing, we don't <laughs> want the same reruns. We want to know specifically, this is what the data shows. What are you doing about that? based off of your contribution and your role in the breast cancer community, what are you doing? And what are the metrics that you outlined in order to deal with it? And at this point, I really feel as black people, if you are not helping, you're in the way, get out the way. We can do it ourselves at this point. I can raise the money and I can move. I can go and, need, and do what I need to do. And that's what I would implore black people to understand, especially black women who are the ones who are the most, you know, ostracized and at the bottom of the totem pole, do not assume that anybody in the room is smarter than you. I love that. I love tell, that, Janelle. Tell, tell us more about, tell us your story and, yeah. and how you got involved in advocacy work. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, girl, hey. Hey. <laughs> I, was, I was diagnosed in um, December 2013 um, after complaining about um, some um, having issues in my left breast. Um, so I knew I was, I knew I had dense breasts, but at the time, no one told me that I should have been getting ultrasound or MRI. So in April, 2013, he said I had a clean mammogram. So in December, 2013, you tell me I had breast cancer and then they tell me I had breast cancer. And then it says estrogen positive. So 
that kind of blew my mind because whenever you hear about the different walks, you just hear about breast cancer, not the different types of breast cancer. And also not about metastatic breast cancer. It's like, it's a scary word. Um, so I educated myself um, um, throughout the whole year 2014, going to different um, conferences, um, being around different survivors. But one specific, specific survivor, um, she was the one that kept me humble regarding um, metastatic breast cancer. She was originally diagnosed early stage and became metastatic at the same time I was diagnosed at 44. And what I've noticed when I was getting treatment, I was having financial issues. So I, I you know, I relayed that to my oncologist. And when I came back to my oncologist, maybe three weeks later or what have you, and I'm still talking about the same thing. And she said, well, didn't so-and-so talk to you? And I was like, who's so-and-so? Mm -hmm. So that's when I realized there was an issue. The other issue I realized that the hospital where I was being treated, they were giving out different, well, having different programs. But I noticed every time I went to these programs, I was always the only black woman, but it was a bunch of black women getting chemo. And I couldn't understand that. So one day I just went to my oncologist and my breast surgeon and I said, do you guys pick out certain black people to get different programs or what have you? Because I don't understand why I'm always the only black person sitting at these programs, um, especially the ones that are free and that can help you financially with your rent, um, food, you name it. And I couldn't understand it. So they were, so of course they looked at me like I was crazy, but I'm looking at them like, this doesn't make any sense. When you have a bunch of black women, young, you know, me being diagnosed at 44 just kind of blew my mind. I was getting um, mammograms since the age of 30 because I had a partial hysterectomy. So finding out women were being diagnosed younger than me and finding out black women were dying higher than white women that was a problem. So when I start going to conference, um, it's all these other uh, events. I asked my survivor, who was my mentor, God rest her soul. I said, are you always the only black person at these events or what have you? And she said, mm, yeah. And I said, well, that's that to me, that's a problem. We have to educate our women. And more importantly, we have to educate the medical community, because unfortunately, whether we like it or not, they are the gatekeepers, and mainly most of them are white people. So that's how I got into advocacy, and the inclusion can help now, because like I said, I was struggling financially, and I'm complaining, and the person who should have been helping me didn't help me, because as a Black woman, I guess they didn't think I was important enough, but Wow. The white women was getting what they needed and they didn't have to struggle. That there mm -hmm. is a problem. And personally, I kind of get tired of hearing white people say, oh, this, that, and the other. We, as black women and black people, we have been struggling for way too long and it makes no sense. And I'm just over it. Let me jump yeah. in here and throw something at you in terms of um, some statistics. So. Uh, I gave a, a Grand Rounds lecture down at Baylor, um, well, remotely at Baylor on Friday on uh, health inclusion and implicit bias. And um, we talked a little bit about clinical trials in Boston. Boston is the mecca for healthcare for the, you know, the Northeast region of the country. Uh, four out of every five women, three to four out of every five white women who are diagnosed with breast cancer are treated at Dana-Farber compared to uh, uh, just about one black woman out of every five who might go to Dana-Farber for treatment and or clinical trials. And when they did this study and they looked at the reasons why, it turns out there wasn't an access to care issue. They have access to Dana-Farber. Mm -hmm. They have access to, um, to the Harvard hospitals. But the, the women remarked that when I went to the emergency department, I was um, ignored. I was not treated. I was not addressed. I went to see the doctor for my initial consult, and I felt like an outsider. There were no doctors who looked like me. There were barely any patients who looked like me. And um, I was not offered 
um, a clinical trial. I wasn't offered the standard of care and they would rather get their care at the community hospitals with the physicians that they know. And I wonder if you can speak to this as we start to tease apart what the barriers are to clinical trial involvement. You know, it's a Swiss cheese effect, right? So it's at the very tail end, the actual enrollment of women in trials, but there's a representation issue. There's a diversity mm -hmm. issue. There's a, a, a treatment and a disparity in how we're even treated. So everybody feel free to go round robin and, and chime in on some of these things as, as we talk about it. I think the major issue for me, the deepest issue is the trust. Um, mm -hmm. People, black people have gone through so much pain in this country. Um, I'm from Liberia, West Africa. I was born and spent most of my young adult life living there. And there's things that have happened that even impacted my life around racism. Liberia was founded by freed African-American slaves. And there are systemically issues that traveled from here to Africa and back around racism that have not been addressed. Um, when you experience pain and trauma over generations, it impacts your physiology, it impacts your thought process, it impacts your cortisol levels, it impacts your decision-making process, it impacts every part of your life, and, and that pain is deep, and, and it causes mistrust, and it causes you to, to um, fear systems and fear people, and, 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 and then there's these implicit um, biases that people just don't know they have, and so the words clinical, Ricky and I discuss all the time, is so clinical. How do you help somebody even before you say, I want your DNA for a trial, how, would you, how, how about you build some trust first? How about you discuss what happened in the past and you help to heal and you help to, you, like it's a big freaking pinball that has to get popped. It's popping now. It's not, it's all over the freaking computer screen. Like it's a big problem. How do you address the mess? And then how do you figure out how to build a bridge help the healing to happen and then to you know be, then you start to figure out how to get patients into clinical trials the other thing is i think um clinical trials are really about legacy not about just clinical trials and so helping people to understand black women understand that these things have happened but how do you build systems that can help us live a legacy that of health or build one of health is also important and giving them access right you know when someone leaves, goes to a trial she's leaving her her job for the day or two She's traveling, there's gas, gas money involved, there's food, there's parking. She's in the trial treatment center getting treatment. She's coming back home. Those are implications that are financial. They affect her workplace, they affect her emotionally. And during COVID especially, she's probably by herself without a spouse or a support system. Right. So there's multiple barriers to, to clinical trials for black women. Um, and to Shamil's point, we're tired talking about this. We know what the barriers are. <laughs> And, but the, the, the pledge is really about, we you know we, we're tired of hearing the same old, same old, drinking the same bath water. How do we now tell people to put money where their mouth is and commit financially and commit by making a difference systemically in every system to ensure that black women have better outcomes? You know, okay. so, yeah. That's, so awesome. That's, awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think um, um, one of the things that I hear from Black women so often is, um, you know, you hear about the history, you hear about Henrietta Lacks and the trust issues, but there's also a level of understanding that's that's not there yet because people don't understand they're going to get standard of care mm -hmm. and they, right. they, I'm going to get the placebo drug and die yeah, and right. uh, because we really just don't even understand the basics of how a trial works. And for, you know, mm -hmm. I hate those words. The word yeah. clinical sounds like a Petri dish and the word trial <laughs> sounds like a failure. You know, I say that all the right. time. Experiment. So, got to be aware we better yeah. talk about it so that you don't feel like you are a guinea pig. Right? What would you call it then? I mean, because on the clinical side of things, it, it to me, you know, if I were a patient, I know I think I might not like the term, but I, I wonder what sounds better to to you who are patients. You know, so so put my doctor hat on. What's a better <laughs> term for it? It's just a it's just a path to learn. It's a path to make you better and make maybe make other people better. You know, I mean, you I mean, know, it's, a, it's another way, it's just calling it chemo. It's, it's another kind of chemo that basically where you're in a situation where you can learn something and somebody else can learn something that could help another person. Because that's really all it is. It's just chemo, right? Or it's a different so, so, well, so knowledge mean, enhancement protocol. Yeah, yeah. So oh, I, I like that. Like that. Like that. Sounds, <laughs> like that, that sounds way better. That sounds that great. sounds sexy too. Right? A knowledge right. enhancement. So that when you had the you know. answer chemo. <laughs> like like what I, I, I just, say I just it's made it up. So. Top of my head. Top of it's my head. It's better than because I think but, a lot of folks don't understand. It's more than the standard of care. You're monitored more. Yeah, my personal experience with the 
Right. My personal experience with a clinical trial, I think also, is that I, th I think there's an assumption that if you're a breast cancer patient um, or you're in treatment, that you have the luxury to go um, to the hospital multiple times a week, multiple times a day. And right. so for me, I don't have like stock, op stock portfolio that I was sitting on that I can now take a year off. You know, I'm the breadwinner since my husband is already a cancer survivor. I didn't have, you know, the option to just stop working, you know? Right. And I think when I participated in a clinical trial prior to being involved in the design, it was like, okay, you got to get this test and this test, and then we monitor you again. And it's like, why would you have to monitor me like 12 times? You know, I understand <laughs> the evidence, but it's almost as if they believe that you have no life. And so mm. I think also um, I appreciate what's being studied in order to enhance, you know, in the clinical setting and the insights from that and how that could improve my care, you know, being metastatic. But at the same time, I think, um, and being involved in the clinical design now, I see that a lot of times you have folks that are operating in silos and don't include the patient. And right. so it's very important to include patients so that they understand what is the what are the implications from the design. So if you're saying, I want this, 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 that, and it's almost like a wedding registry where they're just mm. selecting all the different outcomes that they want, not thinking that this tumor, these tumors that you're studying are attached to a person with a life with children and a job and, you know, have to navigate all the other aspects of their cancer care. So now that I'm involved with the design, it's more so what is the impact to the patient? How far are they traveling? Do they have that personal transportation? Right. Is mm -hmm. it possible to maybe have mm -hmm. community centers that are closer to mm -hmm. that patient mm -hmm. and where they live? And, um, and just thinking about what costs are covered and not covered and having someone to kind of navigate and explain all of that to patients. It's like a whole new um, like right. <laughs> it, it to, your, to your point, to, to your point, like you yeah. having you being at the table helps you to give people who are not of color the perspectives that you bring. Yeah, the perspectives that other people bring. I mean, part of what the inclusion is is like bringing women to the table, women who are living in underserved communities, mm -hmm. don't have access mm -hmm. to the table, and and saying here's what our challenges are because what could affect a white woman living in suburbia is a far cry from what it would affect somebody living in an underserved community who has a lot of barriers. Right. right. So that actually, people... let's not get it twisted because black women make money too. Mm -hmm. Underserved, know, so a lot of times, underserved, yeah. Right. right, a lot of times black women are not underserved, but you do have implicit bias mm -hmm. as far as not understanding that black breast cancer is a separate thing. It's a different so, animal and we have a different life. So I might not right. be in need as far as mm -hmm. financial or I might, you know, not be in a, a you know, having social economic barriers, but at the same time, have it be where it makes sense for my life. Right, you're where still under, underrepresented, but not right. necessarily <laughs> underserved. And right. you know, Roberta, to, to your point, um, Bobby, when we talk about the, the um, survivorship and, and the adjunct uh, support services that are available to patients, Jamil, the same thing still holds true in that, you know, some of the support groups are in the middle of the day. Some of the sessions are not at times that are convenient. I can so totally attest to that. Yeah. Wonderful resources that are available to patients, for example. Oh, it's during the day. Are, Everything right, is during the day. Or, or it's or it's in a remote area, it's in the suburbs. So for example, one of my, my patients can get access to acupuncture, Reiki, and massage. Mm -hmm. But guess where all of the acupuncture, Reiki, and massage places are? Yeah. Not it's in Philadelphia, in the suburbs <laughs> outside of Philly, right? So, yeah. so now you've got to take your time. You've got to get there. You may need child care. So, right. you know, and I talked to this one uh, particular organization. I said, well, what are you doing to, to help patients be able to access the services? Because what's going to happen is you're going to offer them. And you're going to say, well, Black women didn't take advantage of them. Right. And That's so always their excuse. Right. That's what they say. That's right. always their excuse. Right. And, you know, I can attest to that because those integrative therapies still get me through to this day, managing the side effects of the treatments that I'm on. But guess mm -hmm. what? I had to come out of pocket and pay for those myself mm -hmm. um, until I found that organization that you're speaking about because mm -hmm. of the fact that every time at my hospital and my cancer center, right. it's like one o'clock in the afternoon or 10 yep. o'clock in the morning. And it's like, nobody has to I, I think, I think to, to back, to, back to inclusion, the importance of what we're doing is like, teaching people who don't think about these things, why it's important. Right. You know, I've had friends call me who are physicians who are amazing people who are white friends, who are among my best friends. 
call me and say they feel horrible about what's happening and they want to help. And they, they, and there's things they don't think about. And I'm like, right. I would ask, how often have you gone to the inner city to offer your services? How many things have you created in a way that's culturally competent? How often right. have you gone to um, find people of color and offer health fairs or services or transportation to your Loudoun County practice or the suburbs? So it's not that people don't care or there's, right. they, they may care, but they just don't know what to do and how to help or they, they're thinking in their own bubble. So I, I think I'm always, I found. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, you know, as a patient it's hard because I was, I was once in that position where I had to, you know, um, I got ignored, I got pushed away, I got told, to, it dismissed. And it turned out I had triple negative stage 2B breast cancer. And the doctor told me that, you know, just to come back in a year, if I had done that, I would be dead today. Mm. And I know I, because my tumor doubled in size in six months. Wow. And so wow. that's why, wow. you know, Jamil, your story is so powerful because, and so is yours, Roberta and Ricky and Dr. Gary, all that you're doing, because we can't just sit by and be like, what are they doing? Oh. There, are those who, there are those who don't care and who don't we don't matter to them whatever right. the ones that 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 we have to educate and, and and who want to help how do we include people that want to make a difference mm -hmm. and say here are tools to make that difference yeah mm -hmm. what i found is most people don't they don't know or they do know and don't know what they're uncomfortable how to roll you it know, out yeah so yeah. the we really are about creating a, a actionable change mm -hmm. so again we, we try to discuss on the problem it's been discussed over and over we know what they yeah. are but how do we make systemic changes where people are putting money, their money where their mouth is and giving people of color equitable access to healthcare across the spectrum to ensure we have Jamil here for a long, 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 long time. Right. <laughs> Text me at two in the morning, uh -huh. <laughs> ideas, and Roberta and Ricky. And Ricky and I are TMBC patients, triple negative breast cancer until last month, had no targeted treatment. So right. as a patient who's quote unquote cancer free, <laughs> every cough you have, every bone ache you have, every time your chest hurts, every time you have a headache, mm -hmm. worry if it's, if it's a, a recurrence. And that's psychologically, you know, yeah. it's a lot of money, a lot of scans, a lot of, you know, things aren't covered. But those are things that, are, you know, are biased against Black patients who tend to have TMPC more often. Yeah. And, and we so, have a 39% recurrence rate. Right. right. Yes. So our, but you know, yeah, we 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 wake up every morning cancer free right now, but any any can ha anything could happen, man. Yep. Anything could happen. I think the one thing good about the pledge that you're doing though is not only are you getting people to sign it, and you know, in a couple of weeks, less than two weeks ago, she's got 7,200 people signed on it, which is awesome. But mm -hmm. she's going back to them saying, okay, now that you, you signed, doing? what are you gonna do about it? Like write right. it down and put some metrics around it, and then come back and, and tell me <laughs> what you did. And, and we'll follow up. That's a, that's a really important thing. That's like a great thing. Okay, okay, great. And, and you know, we were so happy we got Coleman to sign it. We've gotten some, we've got LBBC to sign it, Metaverse, so, and a lot, a lot of people. But now it's like, okay, what are you going to do? Bring it. Right. But not only yeah. that, as we're not we, done. Right. We're not done. But as we, who, like for myself, I signed it. So my, my goal is to get more Black women to be patient advocates at their cancer hospital. Yeah. So they, at that table. Yes. At my hospital, I'm the only black woman. And when they sit and talk about clinical trials, and I say, well, what are you doing for black people, specifically black women? And they sit up there and say, well, just that. What number. do you mean? I'm like, we can't oh, yeah, find you get that long pause. Right. You get the well. Right. Right. Well, well, right. Well, right. So the first thing they say, well, we're including everybody. And I'm like, I'm sick of hearing that. No, you're not including everybody because you don't even know. Me as the advocate, me in the community, educating not just myself, mm -hmm. but you know our people in the breast cancer community. You don't even realize that how many Black women that are single moms right. don't do what they need to do because they have right. to make a decision if right. they pay for childcare, gas, and all those things. Right. And also, when you make these decisions, you need to have a Black survivor there and take them in the community so Black people can understand. Right. The importance of mm -hmm. clinical trials, um, taking a medication, and you know whatever it is is going to save their life. You need right. to have that mm -hmm. black mm -hmm. breast cancer survivor or or cancer survivor, but that black person that can that black people can identify with and yep. understand what's going on with their bodies and things of that nature. But more importantly, for me, I'm trying to get more black people to sit at the table. I hate going to the clinic, and I'm always the only black 
advocacy. That to me is ridiculous. Can I, I tell you how I hate, I hate going to the meetings and I'm the only black doctor? Well, it, you know, I'm it's the it's, only it, black physician, the only black researcher. You know, ever since college, I went to Florida a and University. I'm a, a proud uh, rattler, but you know, graduate school, Lily White, all of the meetings, all the cancer research conferences, the surgical meetings, and and it is um, pervasive, you know, and and it it is de it's debilitating, I think, and and, and frustrating from the standpoint of um, you know a child of uh, my mother died of ovarian cancer, twenty nine years old, you know, she didn't even make it to thirty. She was diagnosed late and died within a year. My grandmother was diagnosed with breast cancer twice, and so you know I I, I have a vested interest in this. And when you look around the room, there we are, not represented, right. not represented, mm -hmm. despite pipeline programs, despite you know um, initiatives, STEM and STEAM initiatives, despite you know chief diversity officers in pretty much every organization. And so I think we need to talk to allies and corporations and hospitals and IRB committees. I'm the chair of the IRB, the Research Institutional Review. Mm -hmm. For. Why is there not a black patient on our IRB? Why right. is there not a black person on our board, a black woman? Why are we not pulling up seats at the table? Because agreeing with something is not the same as sponsorship, just like mentorship. You know, we can mentor someone or I can sponsor somebody. I can make the call and put myself on the line or I can give up my seat and say, no, mm -hmm. take my protege, right? So we need right. some people to start maybe giving up some seats and making the tables a bit bigger. Right. And that, that's a conversation. And that's what the pledge really gets to, Mayma. And I absolutely love that it now puts people on the line and accountable for creating space and holding those doors open. Yeah, I yeah, actually, we're I excited actually about want to buy a big black chair that I can like carry around and go up and put it places. Okay, I'm here and I have my own chair for your table, right? I just want to right, right. carry it in a backpack and like just show up and sit down, right? Only if it's a, a director's chair. chair, a director's chair, a director's with, chair with a pink chair. ribbon on the back. That's it, right. and a star. Ricky's chair. Right. You know what I love? I, you know, for many years I was going to San Antonio. Cause I like to just go and discover. Oh. And nobody ever say, no one ever said, no one ever said, huh? Explain what San Antonio is all about. San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium is the largest gathering of breast cancer, um, um, scientific communities, um, advocacy leaders, clinicians. Doctors. The best in breast doctors are at San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium every year. And part of me, I'm like, Jamil, I'm curious. I want to know how, how can I, I've been through this journey. So one of my favorite quotes is, um, you know, it's about service is the rent you pay for a living. And so in, in that capacity is how I live my life. And so it was, how do I find, find other people to serve? And how do I see what's going on that I wasn't even told about? So I discovered SABCS and I would go year after year and I didn't know anyone. And I didn't see people that look like me who are patient advocates and or building a, a, a breast cancer. Uh, at the time, even my goal was building a global breast cancer advocacy network. Right. And you know, people would ask me, are you a doctor? Why are you here? And oh, there's other organizations that are bigger and doing other work. I'm on the ground floor. I'm on the, I got boots on the ground helping patients who are, you know, having a rough time, who need money, who need meals, who are not represented. And after going for about five years, I said, screw this shit. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to bring women of color, black women to the table. So we found women from 20 cities that were underrepresented, where that where have the highest death rate. And we told our partners, can you please fund the opportunity to bring them to San Antonio. And we had the largest representation of black women at San Antonio in what, 35 years history that it has. To me, mm -hmm. that's beautiful, but also reprehensible. How is it possible <laughs> that in the history of the largest global breast cancer conference, there has not been this number of black women who are being talked about as not being engaging or represented in trials and so forth. And that was really historic. And, and we were a lot has changed. Every day. We were on the news. We were like marching around the city. Yeah. In the community <laughs> center, you know, all like just like it was exciting, you know, we're, yes, but girl power. Everybody was like, "Who are these women, and what are they doing?" Yeah. But mm -hmm. women left so empowered. They left educated. We built bridges. We had, we cried, we laughed, we talked. And mm -hmm. by the way, SABCS has signed the pledge. They're they're gonna we're gonna they're committing Good. to that in a big way. We'll have more details soon. Mm -hmm. However, ASCO has not signed the pledge yet. So ASCO is the largest um, global oncological cancer organization. That yeah, um, and they bring together all cancers. So yeah. San Antonio is focused on breast. ASCO is all cancers, um, and I want to applaud them for signing the pledge. And we're going to ask ASCO to sign the pledge as well because imagine if forty thousand physicians, advocates, um, advocates, scientists, researchers sign the pledge from all these countries around the world. 
how much better could we impact breast, black breast cancer and also other um, disease states and breast and, and cancers as well. And so anyway, back to my story, sorry, two more minutes, one mm -hmm. minute. It was like, I was tired of being the only person that was like there. And, and I thought, mm -hmm. I, you know, how can I make a change? So, you know, part of the pledge is like, people think that they're not, like to Jamil's point, you know, I'm not smart enough. I can't do anything. They're smarter than me. They have more, more, more brain power, more, whatever it is, your voice matters more than you know. Wow. Um, when I first got breast cancer, Say I was working a full-time yeah. job, you know, didn't know breast cancer advocacy, how to speak in public. I was terrified, but it was one step at a time, one life at a time. And now it's global. So your one action for those watching can save millions of lives just by that one action that can spread over time and through a butterfly effect. So take the pledge. It's like a book. Black women need to understand how much power we have. Yeah. It's exactly. not just power. being at the it's table, but that. our yeah. influence, our dollars. Like if you see an organization that's not committed to dealing with inequities in the black community, don't support them. Don't attend yep. their events. Right, don't go. What are they doing? Buy their product. Don't buy what their have they product. committed to? Mm -hmm. You know, they're not putting their money up. If they're not moving forward with efforts and actually following up and having metrics, don't support them. Get Have them get out the way, support those organizations that are actually committed and care about your life. And I also just want to add that advocacy, even if you're just asking about your own care and asking that doctor questions and not letting them print it out and send you off your way mm. and having them sit there and, you know, answer your questions and have them sit there and explain to you why they're not offering you this instead of that. And what are the implications and what are the side effects specifically for black patients mm -hmm. and black That's people right. and black women. And basically have ownership. Don't, and don't expect other people to care about your life as much as you. And don't okay. just ex right. accept what they're willing to give you as they're functioning as gatekeepers. You know, you demand what you deserve as far as your care goes, at least the standard of care <laughs> at well, a minimum. Just, and, and demand, and learn you as demand much as you can. the right to live. You demand the right to live. Right. Yeah. Learn as much as you can. You know, nothing gets me more than a patient who just says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, okay, okay. And then, you know, I turn and I say, okay, now tell me what you understand about what's going on. And that's amazing that you do that. Oh, right. And I don't have my hand on the doorknob. I put it back right. and I say, now, can you explain this to me? If your mm -hmm. daughter asks you because your daughter's at work, she couldn't make it today or because of COVID, you couldn't bring a visitor. So now what are you going to tell your family when you get home? Mm -hmm. And then we start from right there. And I think too many patients feel like they don't want to infringe on the doctor's time. They don't want to, you know, whatever. And, you know, and they take it at face value and they don't really understand. I can't tell you the number of patients who don't know the difference between ERPR positive and HER2 oh, versus yeah, yeah. BRCA well, well, versus that, BRCA, that, right? Well, Genetics that, versus that, genomics. Right. Right. And so there are resources to educate yourself. You know, we talk about Tiger Lily and the websites, you know, there are, there are multiple organizations that are designed to help educate you about your disease state. And so get as knowledgeable as you can. Don't feel like that's, you know, like you said, Mama, that's above me or that I don't understand. I can't grasp that. Yeah, you can. Yes, right. you absolutely can because once you do, it will it will go with you and you will feel more empowered to ask more questions, to start saying, Well, how could do you have a financial navigator? Is there a social worker? Or, you know, I heard about these services that are being offered at XYZ hospital. How can I get those services? Right. You know, well, just like you this. said, Bobby. Bring, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. bring the articles in. I love to see right. patients bring an article and say, Well, I read this. <laughs> how does this apply to me? Right. Yes. I also encourage white people to instead of just that knee jerk assumptions that you're making about whether a patient is gonna be compliant or whether or not if you should offer it, start monitoring what the standard of care is that you're offering your white patients in comparison to your black ones. Right. You know, start thinking yeah. about, you know, because if you just assume, well, I'm not racist, just because you don't have a KKK hat on, doesn't yeah. mean that you're right. not, you're not <laughs> thing, right? being right. racist towards that patient. If you are, blocking them from getting a treatment that you would have normally went to yeah. bat for that white patient. Think about that. Monitor it so that your implicit bias is not getting in the way. And we all have our biases, but if it's impacting mm -hmm. you as far as informing your decisions, that's a problem. If you, you are, know, you know, feeling offended because the black woman asked you questions and you didn't appreciate her tone. And then now you want to categorize her as a problem patient and she's aggressive and you want to delegitimize her concerns. That's a problem. So let's have some accountability right. and some metrics. And what are you going to do about it? 
And again, do not, Black patient, do not be afraid to go someplace else. And a, and a doctor, yeah, I actually had a, also, white doctor, a white doctor say, well, you know, I provide services. I give gift cards for food. I provide transportation. I have a patient navigator that can, that can give people stuff. And, but nobody ever asked me for it. I said, because they won't ask. Why would they have to ask? Why, would they have to ask? Why can't you just tell them? White women don't have to ask. They, they give it for them. No. And she they said, well, she, she had good intentions because she got all the stuff. She has all the stuff, but mm -hmm. she said, well, no one ever uses it because they're not, you know, oh, please, doctor, I have breast cancer. Can you please give me dinner? You know, like, we're not going to do that, <laughs> right? We barely want to tell our families we exactly. have breast cancer. Right. We don't want to tell our jobs we have. We don't want to tell our churches. We, right. you know, and, and it's really. And ask a white doctor for something. And but I think, I think too, like, as a, as for me, spending 14 years building a, a community organization, to going to the level where I took me 14 years. There are organizations that are the in the in the clique that have been in the clique for many years yeah. that they that I've seen people throw millions of dollars at that went to office buildings, mm -hmm. CEOs getting half million dollar salaries while I having to work for, I have to work for free for you know Ooh, so many years. Hey, you, I'm you, gonna you go, now you coming in you coming down my neighborhood because I'm not black so, female. And I'm, breast surgeon in Philly and in Pennsylvania, right. who doesn't get invited to the table at a lot of places. Well, and, and I would show up and they say, they say what it's been a I, I, I would show up and they'd be like, well, club. but yes, they'd, they'd be like, what do you, who invited you? How'd you get here? I'm like, I How'd brought myself here? here. I saw it on a Facebook page. So I got my car and drove here. Right, and yeah. so, but I had to keep being persistent. It took me 14 years, 13 and a half years to get to be where we're sustainable and we can grow as a, as a premier black led organization. So for me, we ha I want to see investments in community groups and grassroots groups. Women who are on the ground need more resources. So like we're all advocates, we're so empowered. There are women who don't understand what health equity means, who don't understand the importance of making healthier choices, who don't understand what the word <laughs> what the words advocacy mean. So like I want to see investment by corporations and pharma and partners in these groups that are marginalized and need support services. Quit giving people a million dollars to fund yet another, you know, assessment or survey. Yeah. Give it to groups like, you know, like Jersey's. She Do you have neuropathy. She, yeah, right. She had <laughs> Jersey's metastatic patient. She's driving people around who are patients themselves, and she has, um, you know, um, she. I think she had progression recently. So, how do you help people who are like a one-man, two-person operation that's in a underserved community and stop wasting money and go towards patients and, and, and health equity? But we will help. I mean, that's the thing. That's why we stay up all night. Because if people need us, you know, just you know, tweet us, call us. We'll we'll help you because we see how we know how important it is. You know, I'm serving that up for but you. But it for, you know, but it has to be a systemic change. It can't just be has, one, all us. Well, it has okay. to be these systems in place that had to change, invest their money. Yeah, but that's what the pledge is doing. We're lining yeah, up yes. systems and doctors and medical operations to do the right thing. I mean, I used to think when I first had triple negative, gosh. Why don't we have a drug? Is it because most of us are black? Because we you know we get it at twice the rate. I said, why didn't why I used to think that? Drug? Yeah, why isn't there a drug for triple negative? Because we're dying too fast, or what's a, what's up? Ah. And now we, you know, we finally have a therapy that works for metastatic triple negative. I mean, we just right. started a couple weeks ago, and now there's a there's a you know right. research being done for early stage. But but I mean, it really is a black disease, and you know, help us. Why why is it the only breast cancer doesn't have a preventative drug? So. We have you know, breast cancer should be too. treated and as a separate subtype. Hmm? Black breast that? cancer should be treated like its own separate it's, subtype. It's a separate yes. disease. It's a different disease for all mm -hmm. kinds of reasons. But unless we really do the work and participate in trials and and understand that we are, you know, seventy seven percent of black moms are single. So what are they going to do? Feed the kid or go to chemo? Right. <laughs> can we? Can we? I like and to I think share. it goes both ways, though, Ricky. When you talk about the responsibility of corporations, of physicians, of the medical community, the responsibility of the patient as well to be open minded to this information and to consider trials and to um, uh, to taking the ownership of your health as well, like that. That's a really tough thing to do, especially in the face of a new diagnosis, in the face of distrust, in the face of right. uncertainty, and all of the socioeconomic and emotional barriers. But part of this pledge, for, in, in my mind, for patients is the pledge to say, you know what, I'm going to double down on this because this affects my children. Like you said, maybe my legacy, my children's right. children. This affects not just me. This is so much larger than me. And so, you know, I, I want us to... Um, 
to accept the charge within us as well, you know? And sometimes we just need someone to kind of help us navigate it through, like um, what Roberta was talking about when it comes to just having, um, and this is what I've learned, just sharing my story and coaching other women, when they get to see what's possible, you know, it's it's just Mm -hmm. mind blowing. So I think if people are really serious about stopping and ending the depths of breast cancer, you know, dealing with disparities is low hanging fruit. We can improve Mm -hmm. the survival outcomes by, you know, um, an amazing amount if we just focused on that because it benefits all the other patients that are impacted. And just how do, I, I was so surprised living in Philly that the patients that are the least compliant with their care are the ones that are under the age of 60. So the ones that have a job and have every reason to live and have young mm-hmm. kids. So what are those barriers and challenges that they're running into? And so sometimes we just have to be able, even though they want to be proactive and learn and you know really um, be invested in their survival, sometimes we just have to show them how. What's the roadmap to get there? You know. Mm-hmm. So I think if we're focused and we're laser focused on <laughs> Black women specifically. We really can make a big difference with this inclusion pledge. Like everybody involved, based off of what your shop is, what you do, yes. three things. Let's start with that. And then we're going to get eventually to 20 things. Mm-hmm. And then eventually we're going to get to the point where we're going to see programs, solutions, projects. It's not just the same one, 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 same old rerun over and over again. Right. I'm gonna share the pledge page so you guys can see it. And then we should give a link to it in the comments, you guys, can somebody put it? But just so see, you- Mayma, Mayma already did. Oh, great. Um, I believe she put, a, she put a link for it, but I, I want to talk about, um, no, great, perfect, here we go. This is great. Talk us through, Mayma. So the pledge page, thank you. I was texting a couple people who are on the panel right now. Um, I really wanna applaud, first of all, um, Christine, Julia, and Jersey for their leadership. You know, for one thing that's really powerful for me is that these two white women took it upon themselves to point out their privilege and how they hadn't used it the way that they were supposed to use it. And at first I was like, what privilege, you know? And I, I had to learn more about what that meant. And and they, they are awesome women, they're metastatic um, patients, um, but they often ask to be on panels and, and, and on boards and global c- committees that we aren't asked to be on. And Jersey was in the audience and Jersey said, you know, um, you know, I'm here in the audience. Why am I not, why am I listening to you talk about black women and I'm not part of the conversation? (laughs) And and they said, you know, you're right, come on up. And she did. And that's kind of how the pledge began. We eventually launched the pledge officially at San Antonio last year. You can see us all on the stage talking about the pledge. And our first commitment was that we would not be part of anything to your point, Jamil where a person of color, a black woman wasn't at the table. Women of, black women have um, more aggressive breast cancers and higher death rate rates, and we have to change these numbers. If you scroll down, the pledge is really about ensuring inclusion diversity across all spectrums. We spent a lot of time thinking about, because people are like, how can we help? We want to help, but we don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. So here's what you can do. Whether you're an advocate, one person is an advocate. Whether you're an advocate for yourself or not, for yourself or part of an organization, or if you're in pharma, my dog saying yes, awesome. <laughs> right on, Mama. The pledge. That's right. She's, she's like, sign the pledge. Whether you're in industry, whether you're in, you know, a scientist or in policy or in even the churches, people go to churches for, they, they trust their church leaders. So whatever group you're in, how can you take the pledge and ensure that even as one person, you take one action that can change the, the level of equity for black women. And so we managed to get 7,000 signatures in less than a week and a half. Um, we've gotten all these org, org, orgs to sign on, excuse me, to sign on to the pledge. So, you know, if each person took an action, that would, to the point of, of Ricky, Jamil, Roberta, Dr. Mo, it would change a lot for black breast cancer. So we're asking you all to commit to signing the pledge and sharing with your loved ones, because this is really about your lives. And we want to thank our founding members as well. They're all on the page as well. Jer- Jersey, Tamika, Latanya, Jamil, Tia, Valencia, Julia. I don't know who she is in the middle. Um, Christine, Ricky, and, and Dana. Gripping founding members. 
And I want to thank our sponsors because a lot of people in pharma are afraid to commit because there's so much policy involved. And there's some partners. Can we highlight them below? There's some who aren't on the page yet. But immediately um, when we said, can you support our pledge for Black women and inclusion, inclusion diversity for Black women, you know, Amgen, Sanofi, Merck, um, Paxman, Seattle Genetics, people like that, um, and, wow. and Amgen have committed to signing the pledge and supporting it and many others. So it takes, again, it has to be across all sectors for this to work. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sign the pledge, let's hold hands together and change lives. It's right. true, and if, if you're watching and you're an ally and you, you want to know how you can get involved beyond signing the pledge, when you show up at places, when you go to meetings, when you get invited to trials, when you have support services, you can always say, why are there no Black people here? What can call I do? You, you call it out. Call it in. Exactly. <laughs> you know, when you are in your boardrooms, when you are in your nonprofit organizations, when you are in your pharma you know, groups and consortiums and your working groups and you start talking about health equities. If you look around the room and there are no faces that look like ours, there's a problem there and, and it's up to you to be able to say, shouldn't we, shouldn't we invite, you know, someone to the table? What can we do to make this look a little bit different? Because this could all be so different. Mm -hmm. How can we find you? Where are these doctor's offices? Where's, where's the black doctors in your office? Where's the black doctors? If there are any. Right. Yeah. So then the next step of this pledge right. goes to the goes to the colleges, the universities, right. the STEAM and STEM right. pipelines, you know, right. because we really need to to enforce oh, the representation yeah. that needs to happen and yeah. the sponsorship that needs to happen, because there are plenty of black students right. who are majoring in biology and who are desiring to go to medical school and who want to be physicians and who get to be physicians. And guess what? You know, they are discouraged from going into certain fields. They are not uh -huh. mentored in these fields. They are, you know, and, and, and there's so many barriers to pursuing a career in oncology, to pursuing a career in surgery, to pursuing right. a career in research. Research is not rewarded because it's so difficult to get funding in it because it's the hallowed halls of academia. And we have to decentralize that and change the ways that we look at research because, you know, the dais will never look brown and black if you keep giving the same studies to the same people, <laughs> right? Yep. In the ivory towers. Right. It's every wrong. every big change starts with one person. So we've got five of us right here. But all of you that are listening and part of the, you know, our viewing, we, we so appreciate you for being with us and, um, you know, go make something happen. You know, my dad used to say, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. I yeah, let's, I love let's, it. So, let's get shit okay. done. GSD, get yeah. shit done. <laughs> you know, we're the GSD crew. I love yeah. it. <laughs> GSD, we are the crew. Final thoughts, how can we reach you, find you on social media, ask you questions, take the pledge and get involved if we would like to get more involved, people watching. Uh, where can they find you, Ricky? At Ricky Dove, R-I-C-K-I-D-O-V-E. Tweet me, follow me on Instagram and Twitter and I'm here, I'll call you back. Fantastic, Mama, how can we reach you? Find me at Mama Carmo on Instagram, Mama on Twitter or Google me, you'll find me. You yeah, can't right? miss me, right. I'm you everywhere. Know, how, can, how can we reach you? Google me, I don't have a site. <laughs> <laughs> but you're on the, you're on the Twitter because I just followed you on the Twitter. Yeah, uh, Bobby, the girl. Bobby, how can we follow and, 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 and help you and talk to you and catch up with you? Um, Roberta Albany on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Fantastic. I'm Dr. Monique Gary on all social media. And, you know, we hope this has been relatable, reliable, and real. That is what we set out to do with this show. Uh, the doctor is in, and uh, we are here. We will see you next Wednesday night. Um, any closing remarks, Ricky? Because I think that's it. We got our GSD, we got our hearts. Our hearts yeah. And yeah. Uh, we love you for watching. Gonna to, we're going to talk to doctors who had breast cancer. That's right. We'll talk to some of my breasties, some yeah. of my crew, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and we will get a chance to get into the minds of physicians uh, and practitioners who have gotten diagnosed with breast cancer and how it's changed their lives and their practices. So thank you next for Wednesday being night. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everybody. God bless. Thank Be you. safe. Bye. Until God the next you. time. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Breasty love. Breasty love. <laughs> I love it.